I was I saw a thing recently that was it was like a map of the U.S. and it was what the favorite fast food in each state was, and it had both Washington and Oregon listed as In and Out Burger. I'm not surprised. But, there was 14 hour lines at the drive thru when they opened In and Out in Colorado. Okay, but there's only like what one or two In and Outs in Oregon and only one in Washington. We have three now, I think. Do you have three? There's one in Medford, one in Grants Pass, and one up closer to Portland. Meanwhile, like, California was listed as Whataburger as their top one, which seems even more bullshit than Oregon and Washington. Well, I think Whataburger is Sean's favorite fast food. Huh. But I don't think they have them in... Do they have Whataburger in California? No, it's a Texas-based company, but they got a lot of of Chicago. They're expanding now into California. I'm guessing the map was just clickbait, comment bait. Everybody get angry at this and comment so that we get more posts, more traffic type thing. I mean, I do miss Dick's Burgers, and I really miss Boomers. <sighs> I could go for some Dick's or some Boomers. Nick could go for some Nick's drunk and could go for some Dick. The Boomer Dick's. Boomer Dick's? Boomer Dick's? Boomer Dick's? Anybody for Boomer Dick's? Welcome to the special Christmas edition of the Booze and Spirits Podcast. Woo! Christmas! Am I supposed to be excited about that? I guess so. But you're still supposed I'm to say... To you're still supposed to say... Oh, it's like a drink with death! Hooray! I'm Nick McDonald, and that is... I'm Kate McDonald. Kate McDonald. No relation. That's a lie. I just really wanted to say that. <laughs> I guess we haven't mentioned it in a few episodes. I don't know if it's necessary. We are siblings, so... <laughs> I just don't, you know, Babs and Buster Bunny, no relations. I'm having a Tiny Toons moment, apparently. Uh, all right. Um, it's not so, who I am as a person. What? It's who I am as a person. I just, you know, like to make obscure 90s references in my day-to-day life. They're bringing Tiny Toons back. They brought Animaniacs back, which was great if you didn't see it. And they're well, Tiny, Tiny Toons back. is on Hulu because I've put it on for the baby and he didn't give a fuck. Children are horrible. But, Although my kids were very much into the new Animaniacs, so that was exciting. Um, he really likes King of the Hill. That's good. We Mitania. Yeah. We Mitania, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> we have fixed our audio problems for the time being. We may have more audio problems in the future, but for right now, everything is covered. We think. We think. We'll know for sure. I'm so, you know, I set my mic and headphones up, so it should be monitoring what I'm saying, but I can't hear over myself, so... We just talked and talked and talked. <laughs> talked and talked and talked. If I turn my volume to the max, I could hear myself, but then I also hear all sorts of static background noise. I can hear you licking an envelope when I turn it up that high. <laughs> I don't get free time. I have to multitask. We're so off track already. This is it's it's been so Christmassy so far. <laughs> this is our Christmas episode, which is exciting. We decided that what we really need to do is bring back the old Victorian tradition of telling scary ghost stories for Halloween. No. Halloween for Christmas. How about Christmas? Um, we're going to tell stories of good cheer for Halloween next year, but for how, Christmas, well, we're going to tell scary ghost stories. Halloween is how it stopped being like a Christmas thing because the Scottish and Irish immigrants brought Halloween over to America and it commingled into our melting pot and then the spooky story to that. by the Christians. Blah, blah, blah. You know, in my house, we're celebrating Yule Christmaca, so... In my house, we're celebrating Comeuppance Day because my children are going to be very disappointed when Christmas comes around for the way they've acted this year. Fair. Kel is not pleased with my attitude. <laughs> have they been impish or admirable? <laughs> they have been impish like a motherfucker. <laughs> they, have, they have motherfucked admirable into the ground. <laughs> so we decided... Our off track We're off topic so far. We had intended, like I said, to have spooky Christmas stories for our, our Victorian Christmas show. But unfortunately, when you start using the internet as your primary 
research tool and you start and you type in Christmas ghost story, you get primarily fiction <laughs> and mostly from the Victorian era. <laughs> True so it was story. really hard coming up with actual Christmassy ghost stories. Like I found a few like Christmas tales that were attached to some famous haunts, like uh, Alcatraz. Uh, they had a Christmas party held by Warren Johnston, where several guards witnessed a, a ghostly man appear in front of them in a gray suit and brimmed hat and mutton chops. My brain went Warren Jeffs, the leader of the FLDS Church. Mm-hmm. So that got really weird. Warren Jeffs, that's who I thought you were talking oh. about for a second. He's the he was the leader of the FLDS church. He's I believe currently in, no, no, in this jail. Is warden. This, warden, this is a title, not a This name. makes more sense. Yeah, but <laughs> there's no accounting for my brain and where it goes. That's fair. Anyway, this this ghostly image appeared before the guards and then the room grew cold and their old Ben Franklin stove burned out and he vanished again. Not much of a story there. Hey, it's a neat thing, but not much of a story there. Also, you know, uh, Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, uh, um, Arkansas, which is a crazy, of my which is an amazingly haunted location. I found a Christmas story where one evening they had the dining room closed and the grand Christmas tree and all the uh, decorative packages underneath it were all moved from one end of the room to the other. And when the staff showed up the next morning, the tree had been moved, the gifts had been moved, and all the chairs had been placed in a circle around the tree facing it. Again, neat. Not a real big story. We can only talk about that for so long. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, we could go on Eureka Springs for a long time, but that wouldn't be a Christmassy thing. Another Christmas one I found was Roos Hall in uh, Suffolk, the UK, which is a another famously haunted location. Every Christmas, supposedly a headless horseman barrels down the drive to the house, followed by a uh, coach pulled by a quartet of undead horses. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah, they show up at the same time every year, and they dash at the hall at great speed, and then suddenly disappear just before they arrive. Again, neat story, neat Christmas story, not very thick on details. <laughs> so we had to get a little creative with our Christmas stories. I kind of skewed more towards an Arctic flair. I figured, I was hoping for North Pole, like Santa's workshop, but... Uh, it, it didn't work out. I didn't get quite that far north. You know, there's not a lot of people there, well, so that's... it's not that there's not ghost stories there. It's just, you know, they're probably not getting relayed well, to us. There's probably not a lot of ghosts either if there's not a lot there's of people. A lot of, there's a lot of, like, you know, non-disclosure acts and agreements if you work at the North Pole, I'm assuming. Could be. Could also be that. Santa, because, Santa runs a tight ship. Because it's largely uninhabited that most of the spirits up there are not anything not what i would consider a ghost in that they probably are not human in orientation <laughs> i did find so many caribou ghosts caribou so ooh, caribou ghosts i didn't think about that uh one particularly far north one that i found that i found interesting is the circle hot spring hotel it's about uh, 125 miles northeast of fairbanks alaska Weirdly, it's actually closer to the community of Central than it is to the town of Circle. Both areas were established during the gold rush up there, the Alaskan gold rush. The hot springs themselves were dis- were quote-unquote discovered in 1893 by William Greats, though they were in use long before that by the indigenous Athabascan people. That's why the air quotes undiscovered. They were white discovered in 1893. Fair. <laughs> The story has it this the prospector was out hunting and wounded a moose. So, as a good hunter, he chased down the injured creature trying to, to finish his kill and ended up crossing a stream and was surprised to find that it was warm. Later, he came back and tracked the stream miles up to its source and he discovered the spring there. I actually found two tellings on how it was discovered. Another one said it was discovered by George Grow. The George Gross story was a little bit more interesting because they said that he uh, came back the following spring and found plants growing right there next to the hot spring. And he, he checked the leaves and they seemed to be edible. So he pulled the plants out and, and cooked them up and ate them. But he died because the roots were poisonous. He didn't check the roots. He only checked the leaves. Always be suspicious of the roots, gentlemen. So that's like a, he Christopher McCandless it. Before that was a thing. I don't know what that is. Uh, 
Sean says the Alaska hot springs are disgusting. In Japanese culture, it's good luck to have for a boy to have sex under the northern lights. So a lot of Japanese tourists go up there and like use it like a fucking cesspool. <laughs> <laughs> so fill Japanese semen in so many ways. <laughs> Did they come on boats? I really hope they came on boats. They come everywhere. Yeah, uh, Christopher McCandless is the guy from Into the Wild that like left his upper middle class home and oh. backpacked and you know went to Alaska and died in a bus. My mother in law bought me that book and I never read it. Um, interesting book, quick read. Movie's not bad. Eddie Vedder did the entire soundtrack. I remember that because I the remember Big Sun was a big thing. Yeah. You know I love me some Eddie Vedder. Heck yeah. So, in 1906, the Springs became part of a 160-acre homestead belonging to Frank and Emma Leach. Frank was a skilled builder, and he ended up building the hotel and much of the furniture within it, and uh, opened it in 1930 as a place for the local miners and prospectors to relax and refresh. Overtime Circle Hot Springs Hotel, that was harder to say than I expected, was additionally decked out with a log line swimming pool and several wooden cottages and the building and facilities. A log? Log line? Yes. Like well, was that was, I, I, pool? well, that's, I thought it was unusual. It's an author I uh, read a story from. He said that he used to visit it as a kid and he thought it was interesting that this, the pool was lined with logs. Yeah. It was unusual. That's why I wrote it down. <laughs> Carry on, carry on. The building, the building, ah, I'll carry on. The building and the facilities all function to this day, uh, though the hotel itself as a business is not currently functioning, I believe. At least it wasn't up till a few years ago. I believe it's still the case. There is also a cemetery on the property. It's, uh, it's behind the hotel and includes the leeches themselves. There's. My brain went other places, but. Hmm? Forgot that, I forgot the family was named Leech. <laughs> I. I had a supposition like about a that. I, I thought maybe I should but clarify, but I thought, well, nah, nah, I should get it. It'll be fine. Yes, the family was the leeches. Yeah, yeah. Not not someone named all the, the leeches they found in the wood-lined pool. The wood-lined Japanese semen-soaked pool. Yes, that escalated quickly. <laughs> so I found lots of claims that this place was haunted, but I really only found two sources to give me any details or eyewitness accounts. One was uh, the author who talked about the log line pool. Uh, and he was talking to a former operator of the hotel, Susan Natman. Uh, she ran the hotel beginning in 1991. And when she was arrived, the first thing the staff told her was that things would come flying off the walls. Doors opening and closing, footsteps in empty rooms are all commonplace during Susan's time there. Raps on doors, tapping on windows. One incident she described involved a fur coat that was always left hanging in the basement, and uh, it reached out and touched a passing employee. Did it still have faces attached to it, like Ghostbusters? I wish. I seriously doubt it. But it's, it's Alaska. Okay. Things get weird there. Might have. I don't okay. know. Uh, in my head, it still had its little mink heads on it. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll just assume that's what happened then. Another particularly annoying incident occurred in the library. They had brought a teacher up from Fairbanks to evaluate the collection, take out some books, put some new ones in, and whatever they were getting rid of, they threw into a big sack. Now, the sack full of cold books just kept going missing. Finally, the teacher had to plead out loud, Mrs. Leach, I am not going to hurt the library. I'm just going to put it in order. And after that, she was never bothered again. Oh, well, makes sense. Well, um, one night, a worker spotted a man outside the building... Playing a piano, despite it being 50 below at the time. Many think it might have been the spirit of an Irish bartender and dishwasher from the 1940s, who was known to be quite a piano player. The uh, poor bartender had died in the hotel parking lot when he collapsed on the hood of his pickup truck. Was the piano real or spectral? I assume they don't have an actual piano outside, so I assume the piano was spectral. I, I didn't assume they did either, at least not when the weather's like that. It didn't really I, say, but I would have to imagine. The snow piano. It's the snow piano. If we just store it in the snow, it's great for the wood. <laughs> in the bar, occasionally a beer bottle would tip over on its... Uh, sorry, it would travel to the other end of the bar and there slowly tip over on its own. And that had been witnessed by many people many times, apparently. The other source of information I found um, 
was the television show The Dead Files, which did an episode there in their first season titled Arctic Wrath. I hadn't, I hadn't ever heard of The Dead Files before. Have you seen The Dead Files? I've heard of it. I don't think I've seen it, but I have like seen it like on the, you know, the guide. I had to, I did a one week free trial through Amazon Prime to their destination unknown channel so I could get access to all the Dead Files episodes and watch this one. I don't know. It was interesting. They, they send a psychic to a location and they don't tell her anything about what's going on there. Meanwhile, independently, they have a detective or a retired detective and researcher kind of investigate as much about the place as he can. And they kind of reveal both their findings simultaneously. You know, maybe I've like seen bits and pieces of an episode or two, but yes, continue on. (laughs) So while um, Susan's stories were about harmless, mischievous hauntings, the dead files focused on more frightening and dangerous activities, which I mean, it was TV that could just been the producers raising the stakes, but who knows? The show that the show episode focused around the caretaker of the hotel closed during if this was during its closure, and his wife and daughters who I think the daughters didn't live on the property with him, but they visited now and again, and they were very afraid that the ghost might do something to him or him and his wife. They experienced a lot of the common incidents, the doors opening and slamming, phantom footsteps up and down the stairs, so on. One time they left and uh, when they returned, they found that a large rug had been pulled across the room and up, so that was leaning against the door from the inside. From there, things escalated. One of the daughters, she actually worked there for a short time. Uh, she was working there when they recorded it. She had a bottle of furniture polish thrown at her head. Happened. The caretaker's wife saw what she described as a three-foot-tall furry wolf-like creature, which escaped her by squeezing through a golf ball-sized hole into the basement. I mean, you know how I feel about short spiritual presences. You know how I feel if about short spiritual presences. <laughs> if, it's a, if, if it's a wolf-like creature, I'm not as concerned. I don't trust any of them that are trying to keep low to the ground. Those are the ones that are trying to hide from you. Those, those are, yeah, it's like, give me the tall guys. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you don't want the tall guys because the most frightening story of all was that this was actually witnessed by all five of the individuals. A large imposing figure over seven feet tall appeared in a room with them with three heads all stacked on top of each other like a totem pole. Like I said, all five of them saw it, but other than the size and the three heads, everyone saw something different was the craziest part. Some I mean, I'm seeing some, like, logic there now with, like, Alaskan indigenous cultures. Well, what it was, what the psychics supposed was that this ghost was powerful enough that it could actually figure out what was most going to scare each individual and tailor itself to each of them, which is a fairly powerful spirit, if that is the case. True. The caretaker, Bill, for his part, never had a problem with the ghost. Like, other than that one time he was there when he saw the three-headed thing, he never had a problem with them. And it wasn't like they just left him alone. He said that a lot of times he'd be in the basement, and the basement was very cluttered. There's just stuff scattered everywhere. And he'd be looking for something to do some repairs, and he'd wander around, and he'd come back, and he'd be sitting right on top of his workbench waiting for him. So That happens to me all the time. Yeah, well, stuff goes missing, stuff comes back. Borrowers. Psychic investigator Amy Allen, that's her name that's on the show, uh, she got the impressions of a large seven-foot-tall man with a heavy axe and a serious dislike for women inhabiting the hotel. And she decided that was most likely Frank Leach himself. And if he doesn't like women, that would explain why, for the most part, he's happy with Bill, but he keeps harassing the women folk. And he has an axe. That's not menacing at all. (laughs) And she gave the descriptions of what she saw to a uh, sketch artist to draw. And uh, they presented these pictures and everyone kind of uh, uh, said, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I saw. That's what I saw. It it might be worth it for you to watch the episode. When I say sketch artist, I very carefully say sketch artist and not police sketch artist because this dude was doing the most boardwalk beach caricature type (laughs) corny picture. Of these ghosts you had ever seen, it was amazing. <laughs> it's, just, it's it's a little bit worth watching the episode just for that. <laughs> uh, the 
Psychic Amy also thinks she made contact with a very stern and humorless Emma Leach, who they also did a ridiculous caricature of. And she, this was kind of an interesting possible hit, was that she believes she met the ghost of a very confused bride who had died in a helicopter accident on her way to honeymoon at the hotel in 2000. Because there was a story of a couple that got married, and then they were taking the helicopter to the hotel, and the helicopter crashed. And uh, Amy said that she had an image of some ghost who was spinning confusedly and didn't understand anything about what was going on. That um, that that that's not probably a fun ghost life to live. No, it seemed pretty horrible. It seemed like a pretty miserable, uh, ghostly existence to me. Yeah. So that's uh. A pretty good coverage of the Circle Hot Spring Hotel. Now, what did you do for your... I'm assuming you had the same issue I did about... I did. Um, I did kind of consider going the route of reading a Victorian ghost story. Yeah. Which would not have been factual. But, you know, a lot of our stories are hard to prove their factuality. Mm -hmm. So, it would have been okay. And then I was thinking, like, yeah, I could do the Arctic thing. And I got really excited... There's a lot of haunted ski resorts. Yeah. So that might be something we just need to dabble into. Haunted ski resort. Yeah, I mean a lot of I mean a lot of the short hits that I had, like, you know, Alcatraz and Roost Man, it's like, no, we gotta hit this good later, but right now it's not yeah. what we're looking for. And then, you know, I was thinking like there is the Fairmont Hotel in Banff, Alberta. And that's not really Christmassy, but like if you ever have seen pictures of that in the winter, like that is a Christmas dream. It's in the mountains. It's all snowy. And then there's like the Arctic Circle Club in Seattle is a famous haunted hotel. If you're ever in downtown Seattle, it's no longer called that, but it's got, I don't remember what it's called now, but it has these like giant carved stone walruses along the facade of the building. And a pair, like I know that at one point in time they had to go through and make them safer because the walrus tusks were falling to the ground. <laughs> But I decided not to go that route. I'd rather be slightly more blasphemous. And I'm going to talk about a haunting in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Oh, snap. Snap. So it actually appears there are quite a few hauntings in Bethlehem. I'm not sure. I didn't research enough into it to figure out, like, the depth of why it's such a haunted place. But Because they named it it that way? Possibly. Um, but a lot of it that I see like refers back to the, I might be saying this wrong, the Moravian settlement. The Moravians are like a German factor of the Protestant church that were like the first settlers there. So I'm assuming they're, I've like, God, literally like the, was full of weird Christians, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, they use the phrase like Moravian brotherhood and things like that. So I think there might be some like, Illuminati-esque things here I need to explore further, but I didn't make it that far because Killian wouldn't nap, mostly. Teach him to do research. He doesn't read yet. My kids use the internet all day and they go out of their way not to read. His research is putting things in his mouth. If he can put a ghost in his mouth, (laughs) I think we're set. So it was like settled back in 1741 and then so I'm going to talk about the Hotel Bethlehem, but there were others that were haunted. This one just, I just like the ring of it. So it was built on one of the first Moravian settlements in 1741. The hotel was not built in 1741. That's when the settlement was there, I believe. I might be lying. It's really hard to say. I told you, sometimes I just talk and I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the guests and staff at the historic hotel have experienced quite a few strange happenings over the years. The ho- this hotel has started embracing its hauntings. So they decided it was better for their staff to talk about it, is what the hotel historian says. Researching the ghosts at the hotel came out about as an outlet for the staff who were frightened by the stories they had heard, according to her. Her name is Natalie Bach. Does that help? I don't know if she's still the hotel historian. I want to be a hot- haunted hotel historian. <laughs> So I found ghost uh, shaped teething things. Give it to the baby. <laughs> he keeps taking dog toys though. And then the cat takes his toys. They just his immune system's gonna be great. 
five years ago, Bach started logging the stories and researching the archival history of the hotel. She tracked down anyone associated with the hotel, especially the old timers and former employees, and found a resounding theme of paranormal activity. Kind of sounds like something I started to do at my old job. <laughs> one time we left the ghost log in one of the private businesses and we got in trouble. The owner told us if he ever saw it again, he was going to burn it because he didn't need to know about that shit. <laughs> also, leaving a ghost log sounds like something you would do at a party to spite the house owner. What the, is that like just when you have albino poop? Maybe. One time I hung out with Seen in them which is an actual term to refer to a group of people who seen in the... <laughs> True story. <laughs> and we, we crashed some house party, and everybody took turns. I don't know that it was planned, but at one point, everybody went to the bathroom and shit someplace they oughtn't. <laughs> such, a, such a charming group of boys. I, that's somehow worse than them putting a dead raccoon in a shopping cart and walking it around the Safeway. <laughs> Because, like, somebody thought they were really clever for doing an upper decker, and somebody's like, oh, I did it in the shampoo bottle. Like, <laughs> There's a reason I don't let strangers in parties. <laughs> anyway, the hotel now advertises their one. They have one room they op- advertise as haunted. It's room 932. They have reported flashes in the mirror, papers flying off table. One guest opened the bathroom door and saw an entirely different bathroom for a second. So we got, I think we had a time slip there. Ooh. It's not their only haunted room, but it's the one they advertise. They had a man stand at the foot of a bed in his boxers asking, what are you doing in my bed? <laughs> Those guests apparently checked out immediately. <laughs> That's my goal for after I die. <laughs> what are you kids doing in my bed? I hope you have a stick when you do it. What's going on? What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, so that's one of their most popular rooms. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? So they apparently have recorded hours of EVP from this room. Or one of their EVPs, they've got recorded, Where's Mary? I'm locked in the closet. Look at the view. What does that mean? <laughs> Why is this as much information as they give me on this topic? Like, I can't find anything about Mary locked in a closet other than this. <laughs> what is the view of? Something about Mary locked in a closet. Yeah, I don't know. Well, Mary is one of the famous ghosts there, I guess. No, it's May. Do you people say she's Mary? Okay. So was it May in the closet or is May someone different? Um. Well, Mary went by May, it appears. Of course she did. So Mary slash May, we're going to call her May, from what I've read, was like the, was a child that was born in the hotel. So it was called the Eagle Eagle Hotel at that point. Actually, she's referred to as May or Mary Yo, Y-O-H-E. I don't know. Sorry if that's your last name. (laughs) Yo, Mary. That's backwards. That's Yo, Mary. Ah. But her grandfather owned and operated the hotel, and she used to sing and dance in the lobby. Moravians pooled their money and sent her to Paris for formal operatic training. Hmm. In the late 1800s, she was a headlining cross-country star in America. She's on Wikipedia. She's probably on Wikipedia. No, she is. I'm looking at a picture of her Uh, right now. She went to England to perform for Prince Edward, who loved her singing. There she met a wealthy lord, Lord Francis Clinton Hope. She married him. He owned a very famous jewel. He called he owned the Hope Diamond. Oh. I bet this falls into the curse of the Hope Diamond. Yeah. Yeah, I see this. But she left him for a handsome American soldier who ironically stole her jewelry when she divorced him. <laughs> so she was unlucky in love. Um, but lucky at cards. Was she? I no, I don't. That's that's the saying, right? Anyway, they they say that you can hear her singing when the piano player piano turns on by itself because it does. Mm-hmm. And she's also been seen in the third floor exercise rooms and lobby areas. But this seems to be the same person that's trapped in a closet. Oh well, the soldier who ran off with her money was named Putnam Bradley Strong, and that's why you should never trust anybody named Putnam. Right there, that's they're going to steal your Hope Diamond. Never trust a Putnam. That's a, a universal policy, right there. It's like you know, never get involved in a land war in Asia. Never marry a Putnam. Yeah. So then there is um, Daddy. I feel a little weird calling a ghost Daddy. Let me let me tell you that. <laughs> 
The last chef we had, he didn't like to be called chef like most chefs do, so we called him daddy. Yikes. It might have made him more uncomfortable, so it was worth it. Mm. One of my favorite things about my old job is I got to put the specials in the computer. So one time we had, he made a sausage, like a, <laughs> like a white sausage. <laughs> but like he made them in house. And so. They were daddy sausage. On the server's end of the computer, it said, like, sausage special, but the ticket rang into the kitchen as daddy special sausage. <laughs> and I took a serving shift so I could make sure I could sell the sausage. And then I just stood quietly and waited for the kitchen to get the tickets. <laughs> I miss that place. <laughs> anyway, daddy was another, another Moravian. He was born in Germany and then came to the colonies. When he was six years old, he... Across the pond. Across the pond. He uh, was known to have a fearlessness and total disregard for danger. Frequently involved with danger because he was a colonial courier. He came very close to death a few times. He was once thrown from a horse and broke his neck. I he, mean, bike couriers are uh, constantly faced with death, so... Yeah. He ain't special. They, like, he broke his neck and they brought him home, assuming he was dead. Uh, oh, well, maybe... He Maybe a special. was once riding a horse on a courier job and the horse fell through ice and into deep frozen water. Well, frozen on the top, obviously. <laughs> I'm just imagining a horse just... In an ice cube? <laughs> drilling its way through an ice pond. <laughs> uh, anyway, he married Anna Graf in 1762. They were happily married for 53 years, so good job them, for one, for staying alive that long. Well, she didn't have a Hope Diamond. That's true. They didn't have any children, but they raised three children that missionaries sent to them. And there was a famous girls' seminary in town, and they educated girls there. They educated girls, and it's called Daddy. Like, I feel a little, I, I just feel wrong, probably. <laughs> it was perfectly innocent. Yeah. I'm sure. Anyway... They still say he is assisting the guests in town. Is there any... This this story got really boring. It was just him being daddy. <laughs> I can't find any, like... Well, okay, so here's here's some actual stuff he did. He has been... Get weird with it, daddy. Get weird with it. We he's decided some... it... Well, he's been in the boiler room. We need some content. Yeah, infrared sensors have, de have detected the movements that corroborated the reports of seeing a man in a black tricorn hat and a black wool cape. The dark figure appeared to former night engineer, Steve. I don't know. I don't trust a guy named Steve. And disappeared into a cloud of smoke <laughs> that flew across the room. Fox said that Steve would lock himself in his office and he would see shadows moving back and forth under his door. The deepest recesses of the boiler room where a panel revealed that a tunnel that by now was filled but was once used by the Moravians to escape Native American attacks. And there was a psychic named Linda Farmer, also was there once, and she said there was a man suspected of being him, of daddy, checking in on all single female travelers throughout the hotel. <laughs> so. You got enough soap? You need some soap? I've got some soap. Daddy's a perf. <laughs> we've got, we've got underwear if you didn't bring, if you're short on underwear. We've got a stockpile. Slightly used. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh out of the vending machine. I wish they had those here. I would sell all of mine. <laughs> Who wants feet pics? Patreon coming next year, everybody. <laughs> sit on a cake and tell me that you love. <laughs> you say sit on a cake? Yeah, cake sitting is the thing. Oh, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Moving along. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh my God. let me see if I can find enough about Mrs. Brongy. You don't have any more daddies or, or uncles or yes ma'ams that we can talk about with the... Uh, Moravian. Who <laughs> Scoutmaster Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> There's not a ton about the Brongs, but they sound like our kind of people. So the Brongs were the innkeeper. Brong it on. Yeah the 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 Brongs were uh, Ooh, it's cold in let here. go from their positions as the innkeepers after six months. Because Mr. Brong had an issue uh, with imbibing too much. He really liked to join any and every guest who requested a drink. Okay, yeah. And he was often had to be removed by the bartender because he couldn't set up straight anymore. 
And Mrs. Brong had a habit of not wearing her shoes or stockings around the end. And that was, that's no big deal now. I mean, I understand that was scandalous. In, then, in 1833, like, that was pretty crazy. That was, yeah. Guests would arrive via stagecoach. They'd be greeted most politely by Mrs. Brong. And to their shock and mortification would find her pedal extremities completely exposed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pedal extremities. Yes. Because you said pedal, and my brain went some Georgia O'Keefe place that I no, wasn't no, no, sure no, no, no. Like, you meant right. Like pedaling my bicycle. Like. <laughs> uh, let's see. But some of the staff has seen a woman in period clothing with no shoes or sock. She's uh, primarily seen in the kitchen and restaurant area. Okay, but here's the thing. Why is that weird to modern witnesses? I think they're looking for it. Possibly. And then there's also the ghost of a former caretaker that seems to be in the basement. A psychic came in and said they felt that there's a ghost hiding other ghosts in the basement. And they have historically readed this back to Mrs. Hop, who was harboring slaves. I was about to ask, is this like a ghost railroad? Brought from Virginia. The, the other side railroad. So. Neat. So, you know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> cool is that i, I guess i mean there's that there's more but like this is all in one hotel so i think it's you know yeah no i, I assume you were all going off of the hotel stuff there. going off a rail all right i did find one more story in my arctic circle search that i thought was interesting which is the phantom trapper of labrador no applause. I want the Phantom Retriever. Phantom Retriever of Labrador. <laughs> so the Phantom Trapper is a ghost seen in Labrador, as you might have expected. His presence often portents a coming storm, a large storm. The person most commonly accredited to be the Phantom Trapper is a man named Esau Gillingham, who is also called Smoker, because who the hell knows how to pronounce Esau? Esau? So he was a Newfoundlander, which is different from Labrador, if you've studied your Canadian geography, as I have not. But he would... You didn't do that? I feel like that was very important to sixth grade. <laughs> Along with uh, learning all your airport codes? No, I'm serious. We did Canadian geography, I think, in sixth grade, and then Central uh, America, when I learned about the Incans and the Mayans. We always learned the cultures. We didn't spend a lot of time on the actual layouts. I mean, we looked at a map, I'm sure. <laughs> So, being a Newfoundlander, he would regularly cross the Straits of Belle Isle into Labrador to trap. So, <clears throat> like most of the stories I tell, I end up finding two different versions. Um, depending on who that tells the tale, the first is that trapping never made him the kind of money he wanted, so he set up an illegal still in the tall spruces. Good for him. <laughs> and this was a swill made from pine cones, sugar, and yeast that he called Smoke which is where the nickname Smoker came from. The other version of the tale is that he brought back very fine, valuable furs whenever he returned, which was kind of fortunate, since uh, in this version he was a horrible, raging, hot-headed, woman-attacking asshole. And the money he and his skins brought into town was the only thing that would convince the town people to put up with him for a little while. <laughs> so, drunk and abusive, he'd eventually wear out his welcome, they'd boot him out of town, until the next time he had a load of furs. And he still made and sold the smoke in this version of the story. It was just more of a feather in his ne'er-do-well cap than a key part of his origin story. Okay. And, and in some of the stories, he was such a nasty character that he would go ahead and sell the smoke, even though it was poisonous. Whichever version we want to go with, probably the more colorful one, the Mounties eventually found his still, smashed his kegs, which my autocorrect changed to legs, smashed his kegs, not his legs, and hauled him off to jail in St. John's for a year. Given a year in the cooler, Smoker had plenty of time to plan the next stage of his evolution. After he was released, he went around begging or stealing every white husky he could from the nearby area. And eventually built himself a whole team of, of pure white huskies. Some say it was a team of eight. Others say it was a team of 14. Neither of those seem like real important numbers in numerology. So I don't know why those were the ones that they kind of gear towards. But 
oh well, whatever. He made himself a suit exclusively out of white skins. He restarted his distilling business, and then he- not from the Huskies, right? Like no, 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 no. The okay, no, he just kept tricking- the dog team. He just made a you know because he was a he was a uh, he traded furs so he would get the white skins and make a suit out of them. You know, minks and weasels and whatever else you could find that was white. And he'd restart his distilling business, and he painted his komatik. I'm probably saying that wrong, komatik. And uh, kegs white as well. So now he's got an all-white suit, he's got an all-white dog team, he's got an all-white sled, he's got all-white kegs. Then he started selling his contraband booze again. (laughs) So the uh, RCMP tried several times to shut him down, but his new drip made him possible to track for a long time in the snow, all decked out in white, like a uh, Puffy video from the late 90s, early thousands. There's several tales about how Smoker finally met his end. Some say he harassed... too much wine. I can't say words. Words, words are words hard. Are Mine is just, I am a slur. Some say he harassed the wrong innkeeper's wife and got shot down by his husband. Her husband. <laughs> Some say- Her husband? <laughs> his husband was big. Take a million. Some say he harassed the wrong innkeeper's wife and got shot down by her husband. <laughs> Some say he simply got lost in the wilderness or got caught in a vicious storm. For my money, I choose to believe the full superhero origin version that it was his own smoke that did him in. Uh, While soused on his drink, smoke fell off of a fish flake and broke his back. Um, If you don't know what a fish flake is, because I had to look it up, it's one of yeah, I was gonna. (laughs) It's one of those large. Sometimes they're a-framed drying racks, basically. Oh, okay. Sometimes sometimes they're A-frame, sometimes they're flat with like a netting. But basically it was a fish drying rack. Anyway, he fell off one of those and broke his back. And he lay there suffering, unable to move for three days. Knowing his time was drawing to a close and having a pretty good idea of what was waiting for him in the great hereafter, he shouted out, Lord God, don't send me to hell. Let me drive my dogs to the end of time and I'll make up for all the bad I've done. Eventually, Smoker's body was found and retrieved and buried back in Newfoundland, but he would not find peace in the grave. Even today, the howl of the Labrador wind is sometimes joined by the sound of a dog team running through the night. Some hear them passing by in the snow, while others have heard their traces slapping against the outside of the cabin. Traces is jargon for their strappings. The harnesses. I mean... When you said the, I don't remember what you said, but the kitten meowed at a very adorable time. Pertinent. Thank you. Thank you for your input. <laughs> the thing is, I'm not drunk. I just am retarded. I'm going to move on. Uh, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, a person might catch a glimpse of an all white dog team being driven by a figure in white furs on a white kamatic. Uh, but they never leave tracks in the snow or stop in their eternal run. God, it's hard to start back up after that. Stories tell of a Labrador man who got lost in the blizzard while driving his dog team and became desperate to find shelter. As he drove on, he was passed by a team of all-white dogs driven by a man in white furs. Sensing this was his best opportunity, he followed the team. A half hour later, the lost man and the white driver came upon a fishing village. And hearing approaching dogs... A fisherman stood in the doorway of his hut to see who was approaching. The the white driver continued on past the hut with his team, and the lost driver slowed to a stop, thrilled to find shelter, and called out to the the white driver, Thank you! You're welcome! (laughs) Did that sound like real words? (laughs) (laughs) You sounded like uh, like some drunk hero trash. Are you wearing a velvet <laughs> suit right now? You, you, you have your leisure suit on? I, I, I'm just afraid of I'm talking like drop. Adam Sandler's Dracula in Hotel Transylvania is what I'm afraid of. You're welcome, called out the fisherman. Come and get warm. Uh, the lost man thanked the fisherman, but corrected him that he was calling out to the other driver. The fisherman just looked at him strangely and said he never saw or heard another driver. My story is getting much more dramatic as the wine kicks in. Red wine. red wine. Red, red wine. You know how I always have fun facts? Fun fact. Don't give girls red wines on dates. Why is that? Because they'll 
They're going to have to cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is a life observation, not an actual fact. I was just one. Eight, and there, man, it's a bad part of. That's a part of personality nobody should foster. <laughs> Your part? I was just wondering about. Would. Well, what? would that make them more susceptible if they were crying? Like. <laughs> Lap dance is always better when the stripper's crying. Um. Another story. I got another story. Let's move on. Another story involved a man who was on foot, and he got caught in a blizzard and had nearly frozen to death. Sean is literally in the other room singing that song now, I'm pretty sure. Red, red wine? I just hear, no, the stripper oh, slap dance. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask if he was singing Elvis or UB40, but uh, I guess there's only one version of lap dance when the stripper's crying. I'm going to start that over because I completely put my emphasis on the wrong spots in that. You put the emphasis on the wrong syllable? <laughs> I did. It was horrible. Another story involved a man on foot who got caught in the blizzard and had nearly frozen to death by the time the phantom trapper had found him. The trapper easily picked the man up and set him on his sled and covered him with warm skins, driving him to the nearest inn. Upon arrival, the trapper easily picked him up and carried the man inside, sitting him on a chair next to the fire. The trapper turned to the innkeeper, told him to take care of the half-dead man, and then promptly disappeared into thin air. Hero, villain, or anti-hero, the Phantom Trapper, or sometimes the Damned Trapper, he has become a proud piece of the local Labradorian folklore. Uh, he's even fictionalized in a 1972 novel called White Eskimo, a novel of Labrador. So who says the Canadians are more culturally sensitive than we are? I mean, we all know Canadians are nicer than we are. Only white Eskimo. Only one I know. Only white Eskimo in my Wow. <laughs> you know that song, right? This is a real song. No, the actual song is I'm the only gay Eskimo in my tribe. <laughs> it's a real song. <laughs> I just, I just assume this is what happens when we soak your brain in your <laughs> wine. So anyway, the Circle Hot Springs, the Phantom Trapper, Arctic Circle, that was as close as I could get to Santa's workshop, was as close as I could get to Christmas stories. So you couldn't find any Christmas midgets. I mean elves. I didn't even think of that. Well... You know what? Our show, we our show, of, we have not... Does our show have a disclaimer that we are not very PC and we don't mean it Probably intentionally? Probably should have one. I was going to say, so far our show has kind of largely stayed in the realm of ghost stories and not delved into some of the more esoteric levels of the paranormal phenomenon, like fey folk and gin and that kind of stuff because I kind of wanted to keep it more base level. I wanted to keep it more folklore than holy shit things are in the dark looking to get us. I don't have a comment. I brought that to a crashing fall. <laughs> a crash stop. <laughs> the things are in the dark that are trying to get us. I know that and you know that but we're trying to keep it light around here damn it. Crazy Katie Ray's demon removal services. <laughs> You got the ghost, we got the salt. <laughs> I'm sure eventually at one point we'll build ourselves, either by necessity of running out of kind of traditional ghost stories or just because we quit giving a shit, eventually we'll get ourselves into some of the more dangerous realms. Our way to the The danger more dangerous zone. realms of the paranormal, but try to keep it light early on. Let's, let's, let's bring people in gently before we get into all the horrible shit that some of us know or suspect is lying out there on the outer realms of the imagination. I don't know what I'm going to do when Killian starts losing teeth, because we're not going to deal with that fairy propaganda in this house. But I also don't want him ostracized by the other I kids. encourage that. I mean, we did the tooth fairy, we do the tooth fairy, but I understand your point. Sean says ostracizing builds care. I have. Well, it's, he's he's not wrong. It's, it's December, so it's almost a daily discussion on why we don't allow Elf in the Shelf in the house. I hope Elf in the Shelf is a dead trend in a few years when my child is looking for it. Boy, where was I? I was going to say something about that was the stories we had now. Stories! I hope that's a the Arctic Circle. Now I just want an Arctic Circle burger. Are there any Arctic Circles still left? I don't know, but that sounds fucking There cool. was one in Salem at one point in time. Googling it. Hold, please. Let me consult the Oracle. Okay, Siri, are there any Arctic Circles? I'm Googling. There's one in Newport. Really? 
Let's see. I would stop there if I'd known that. I've been to Newport a couple times in the past few years. Um, Just stopping at McDonald's like an idiot. There's still Arctic Circle in Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. Shit, yeah. Let's see where they're in Oregon and Washington. Oregon, there's one in Newport and one in Woodburn. Washington has one in Yakima. That's a little far for me. There's two in Wyoming. There's one in Spanish Fork, Utah, wherever that is. There's a bunch in Utah. Are they owned by Mormon? And there's a bunch in Idaho. So they might be Arctic Circle, a white supremacist company. Do uh, I need to... Don't know. No, don't. I don't want to know. Because I want an Arctic Circle next time I drive through Newport. It was a joke, mostly. Yeah. They still exist, at least. We can open our own franchise! Fuck yes. That's what we're going to do with our Patreon money. We haven't started Patreon. I know, but coming in 2021. Yes. <laughs> if, if you like our podcast, and if even more, you would like more Arctic Circles to be open. If you like cheeseburgers, and you'd like us to shut up. <laughs> I like cheeseburgers, and I'd like us to shut up. <laughs> So, um, that's what I got for stories. Did you, are you comfortable talking about your drink selection for the Yuletide? Well, if you're comfortable with me not giving you an exact recipe, because I'm still fine-tuning that. The exact recipe never comes to me before the week we post the fucking show notes, so I'm perfectly fine with that. I like to keep (laughs) secrets. It's called job security. That's fair. In a position for which I collect no money and spend money during a <laughs> industry shutdown on alcohol, I wouldn't normally drink. It's how it slows me down. It's how I pace myself. <laughs> I buy things like Goldschlager, so, you know, it takes me longer to drink it, as opposed to Pendleton. What's really smart is if you're two people with absolutely zero income amongst you and you decide to start a brand new business picture. That's always a great... Hence, me be w- being willing to sell feet pictures or set on a cake. <laughs> Patreon coming 2021. Or this weekend, if you text me, if you Venmo me some money for feet pics, I got you. <laughs> Shit, I'll sell feet pictures if that's all it takes. Are people into Hobbit feet? We did have a, we have a, a work group text message thing going, and we were talking about, like, you know, they keep changing what restaurants can and can't do. Yeah. And it got on the track of selling feet pics and dirty underwear. And I think I... I haven't seen any rules against that as far as COVID's related. I think I scared my coworkers, though, by how much research I had already done into it. So I told them, like, the most lucrative places to do this and <laughs> that we would get a P.O. box. It got dark. Onlyfans.com slash booze and spirits. <laughs> it's pictures of... It's not a real thing, I hope. It's not... Not, not, not that we're running. Right now, someone is is claim jumping that website from us. I mean, the dog's got a juicy booty. I would gladly put underwear on him and post pictures if that's what you people. Want. <laughs> His butt is always in the way. Cows eat it for him. Hide some dirt on Daddy's shirt. It's, it's always, always in, in the way. way. We're perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want me to talk about a drink I haven't made yet? <laughs> you could, why don't you talk about several drinks you haven't made? <laughs> it is a holiday episode. I guess we could do both drinks, huh? You really want to. Well. Not to put the pressure on you. You can bow out. Of if there's more, more than just four of us for Christmas, because the baby doesn't drink a whole lot, I think I'm going to make Tom and Jerry's because a warm Christmas milk punch should be more common. Also, it'll give me an excuse to obtain a Tom and Jerry's punch bowl set. Also, warm Christmas milk punch is possibly my favorite sexual act. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to respond to that. Uh, sh- should I talk about a Tom and Jerry's? What that is? It's not just a cat and a mouse? Yeah. So, Tom and Jerry's is a traditional Christmas time cocktail. And uh, it's not named after the, uh, the cartoon. You can buy Tom and Jerry batter pre made. It's not as common as it used to be, but, you know, it's kind of like buying hot buttered rum batter. This sounds like a kind of Victorian era type thing from what little I read about I believe it. so. Well, yeah, like 1820s. That's Victorian, right? Sure. Why not? That, where'd the recipe go? Hold on. Hold on. I hold had on. a recipe pulled up earlier. Hold, everybody. Hold. Hold work, please. And then, okay. So, Tom and Jerry's. 
I don't believe in making it. You can make it by the cup, but I don't believe in this. If you're making it, you need to make a punch bowl full of it, in my opinion. Sounds fair. Which involves a dozen eggs, a cup of sugar, a bottle of brandy, a bottle of aged rum. That's a relative small amount of sugar for how much everything else. Well, I mean, rum and brandy are relatively Well, I know they're full of sugar, but I'm saying every other Christmas recipe I have, it's like, oh, pour so much sugar into Hawaii is upset with you. Um... A stick of butter, we're using allspice, cinnamon, cloves, vanilla, and milk. And then this is where it gets real interesting. This is why it's considered a pain in the ass drink. This might be why people don't make it anymore. <laughs> you have to separate your eggs, and then you, like, cream your yolks with butter and sugar separately. Um, and then you have to, like, beat the egg whites separately. You mix it all together into a batter. And then you heat the milk in the saucepan and, like, start adding the batter to the warm milk uh-huh. to make it into this punch. And in the past when I've had it, I've had it served with some ice cream in it. And um, good memories. So is the alcohol in the batter or is the alcohol separate from the batter? Uh, you mix it into the batter. But okay. but it's very low, so it's not burning off much alcohol. Well, you're mix- you're mi- warming up the milk and then adding the batter. Okay, got it. Yeah, you're not like making this in a crock pot. We're not flambe. No. No, we're going to keep the alcohol in the drink and then in our belly. <laughs> but my my drink for this episode that I opted into, because apparently I'm feeling sugary, is a white chocolate and peppermint martini. Hey. So I would recommend only drinking one of these if you don't want the hangover from hell. <laughs> and I'm still fine-tuning. Do I want to use peppermint schnapps? Is it better with peppermint vodka? I was thinking where peppermint vodka is a thing. That's how old school I am. I was like, ah, peppermint schnapps. Of course, that's how you put peppermint on liquor. Do I just want to infuse peppermint? I have so many options here. Probably don't want to infuse them because December is busy. And apparently I'm making a giant batch of Tom and Jerry. So I have a ton of old peppermint extract left over from when I had a peppermint plant in my herb garden. And I didn't know what the hell to do with it. So I just made a ton of extract. Oh, Sean's dad is sending us homemade peppermint vodka. Peppermint vodka sounds weird because I know at its base level that means peppermint and potatoes, and that just doesn't sound right to my brain. You just need to assess the magical properties of both when combined. I also really want to make coquina. I might not be saying that right, but it's like a Puerto Rican eggnog, essentially, Hmm. which has nothing to do with this episode and just has to do with me wanting to drink the things. Because Look up Coquina, and maybe next year we'll talk about it. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's got like, it's kind of like Trace Leche's kick and eggnog. Make a drink. Really? It's got like evaporated milk and condensed milk and like creme de coconut. So we will publish the details about the peppermint white chocolate nardini theory. Maybe a Tom and Jerry's? I mean, I can. we can at least post a recipe. I don't know if I'll get... I don't want to make it in a punchable size fashion for two people. Oh, okay. I get what you're saying. You don't want to... Someone has to keep my child alive. And if I drink half a punch bowl <laughs> of Tom and Jerry's, and Sean drinks the other half a punch bowl of Tom and Jerry's, the dog is in charge at that Please. point. <laughs> All right, that's fair. <laughs> Like, I need at least, I'm going to say I want five people that can drink more than one drink present because it makes 12 servings. I guess so. uh, You'll have a Tom and Jerry recipe. You'll have a chocolate. Did we even talk about a chocolate martini? I don't remember even talking about it. White chocolate peppermint. I might have just said that. I remember we said that, and that was kind of the end of it. And then we sighed. It was a a, tangented. It was a side quest. We tangented like a motherfucker. It'll be Merry Christmas because... We have no idea what that recipe will look like at this point. It was a side quest. I'm going to use <laughs> Godiva. Extra credit. White chocolate Extra credit. liqueur. Godiva, white chocolate. Can you even call it Godiva if it's white chocolate? White chocolate is just sugar and butter. How is that? Godiva makes a white chocolate liqueur. Oh, okay. That's Never mind. I missed that part of the equation. Like, It's not like I named it Godiva. Godiva made it. It's not Lady No, Godiva. I know. I know you didn't. I was just figuring out why Godiva would put their name on just white chocolate and butter. But if it's a liqueur, I guess that makes that, that takes a little more yeah. skill. I mean, I'm not on their marketing I mean, peppermint team. schnapps. We've seen my marketing Or vodka. Skill. 
or extract or I don't know, however many more ways you can I mean, I it. bet the alcohol content's higher in the extract. That counts for something, right? So is the taste of ass, I would assume. The taste of, oh, <laughs> the taste of ass content is higher. I was trying to figure out how there was so much alcohol in the taste of ass. <laughs> no. So I guess for uh, the sake of everyone, we should call that the end of this Victorian holiday episode of the Booze and Spirits podcast. Christmas! Christmas! Do we have a topic for the next episode? Well, I'm not sure what our next episode is. I've got a few things ready to go on some... I'm really obsessed with the Ghost of Alice Reem on Orcas Island right now, but I don't know if that's next on the list. I found a good story about Ridgeway, Wisconsin. Sean's sister moved to Orcas Island. Yeah. So I, uh, when, when there's less COVID things happening, I'm hoping we can road trip up. I really want to take him to Concrete... I got Kel on board to visit Orcas Island to go look for you, Alice Reem, but uh, she does know that it's for a ghost. Oh yeah, she may not know. I don't know that if I explain to her that it's a ghost that um has sex, but <laughs> oh, is that why you want to go find this ghost? <laughs> I'm just obsessed by this ghost. Like apparently, like that's one of the, I, the apparently haunts she's is, a freak. I don't know. She is a freak. Like apparently that's one of the things people report is that they hear the bed in her room creaking and her moaning. Like that's one of the things that they report. She can bridge from the couch to the cot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the kitten. Did that have to do what I was talking about? That didn't sound like the that. kitten. Not not. I hope not. <laughs> she's a baby. <laughs> That's your fault for bringing a kitten into a sex ghost conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't really decided what the next episode's going to be. We have several possibilities, but we really haven't figured that out. Ghost sex. Ghost sex? Do you want ghost sex? Maybe I'll put a poll on Instagram. Ooh, there's an idea. Full on Dan Aykroyd and Ghostbusters type story. Some full frontal Dan Aykroyd. Full frontal Dan Aykroyd. I mean, Dan Aykroyd, like, didn't he grow up in MUFON? Oh, yeah. No, he even better. He grew up, like, his parents ran an occult bookstore. Like, it's even better than that. God, that's the dream. Isn't it? I'm going to open an occult bookstore when I'm not broke after I buy. Sean and I picked out, a, like, a historic mansion we want to buy in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has a million dollars they'd like us to have, we're ready. And it I has, will I will support your choice to give them a million dollars for this mansion because it's pretty dope. It has like twelve bedrooms. Like you can come stay with us for short periods of time if you give us a million dollars and are non invasive. Patreon coming twenty twenty one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Donate a million dollars. Come stay for a week in a mansion. Can you? Can you? It's probably haunted. Can you just like what's going on in my ear? This is my life right now. Like you're being attacked by animals. Dog head. No, I'm holding a kitten that is being loved aggressively. Ghost sex. Some call it stalking. He calls some, it love. Some call it stalking. Some call it ghost sex. <laughs> 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 oh, please be sure to check out our show notes. We will have links to however many recipes we decide to fit into this episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to give you a recipe for, like, cookies, too, just for fun. And I'm going to give you a recipe for... I don't know. Papyrus, top cocktails. Papyrus paper, because fuck it. It's Christmas. Who cares? Be sure to listen to the podcast on the podcast distributor of your choice. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, YouTube, if that you so desire. I am still planning to make a fancy YouTube version of this episode. We're on the Instagram. We are on the Facebook now. Instagram is at Booze and Spirits Podcast. Facebook, we're still fighting with Facebook the Boss Twins about the URL. Yeah, an actual URL. But it's it, Booze Plus Spirits Podcast. If you go to boozeandspirits.com, we will have links to all of these locations. You will be able to find them and then in you one can, way or another. Then you can tell us that you love us. Give us encouragement because I'm a millennium and I need constant reassurance. And I'm a Gen Xer and I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Please don't end up our next ghost. Ba-dump-bump. Now, now you're going to ba-dump-bump that? I've made that comment.
comment almost every episode. Yeah, I'm usually drunk by the end of the episode. That's fair. But now you're out of, uh, I want to say Prosecchi, and I know that's not the right word. I'm... <laughs> persnickety. You're out of Persnickety. I'm out of Prosecchi. <laughs> I'm going to have to switch to whiskey. <laughs> Is that a, a whiskey mimosa that I smell on your breath? <laughs> <laughs> Just whiskey and orange juice. It's real classy. <laughs> it's a vodka mimosa. <laughs> All right. Signing off for 2020. Hopefully seeing better of everyone in 2021. Could it be worse? It'll be worse. If we if we think it can't be worse, it'll be worse. So everyone get in your fucking head that it can be worse. Or you're going to get ghost raped in 2021. Because we've had like three years of people saying, God, I can't. I'm so glad it's a new year. The last year is so bad. And like. Then the next year ends up being worse. Fucking knock that off. I mean, I'm going to be honest. 2020 was better for me than 2019. Was it? But I have an adorable child, so. Oh, well, that's fair. And I didn't work 50 hours a week this year. I have the same old children, and they just keep getting shittier, so. <laughs> it didn't work out well for me. Uh, we've taken the training collar off of Theo, if you'd like to borrow it. Yes. Oh, I thought you meant Theo. Yeah, sure, that too. <laughs> I'm just thinking shock collars might work. Anyway. Merry Christmas to all Yay. and a happy 2021. We'll see you next year. On the on that note of shock callers on children, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all. And to all get stuffed in a chimney. I mean, that's what children are designed for. <laughs> you need your, ch- your chimney swept? Who's going to fit in there better than a kid? <laughs> Have you seen the diagrams of children chimney sweepers? Hoping one is yours Waiting for hours Waiting for you to come home